For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Canoeing in remote areas presents a perilous venture fraught with potential disaster. The unforgiving wilderness, isolated from immediate help, can quickly turn a seemingly tranquil journey into a life-threatening ordeal. Inexperienced adventurers, lured by the allure of untouched landscapes, often underestimate the treacherous waters and unpredictable conditions that await them. The lack of rescue services and communication exacerbates the risk, leaving individuals vulnerable to the mercy of nature's whims. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Canoeing in Manitoba, Canada offers enthusiasts the opportunity to explore a diverse and breathtaking landscape of lakes, rivers, and wilderness. Manitoba is home to vast and diverse wilderness areas, offering rugged ecosystems and landscapes. Manitoba boasts an extensive network of waterways, including rivers, lakes, and wetlands. These interconnected water bodies create a vast and diverse landscape for canoeing, kayaking, and fishing. Notable water bodies include Lake Winnipeg, the fifth largest freshwater lake in North America, and the Hayes River, historically significant in the fur trade. Canoeists on the Hayes River route are treated to stunning scenery, including boreal forests, expansive landscapes, and the rugged Canadian Shield. The route passes through diverse ecosystems, offering a chance to witness a variety of flora and fauna. The Hayes River route presents a mix of calm waters and challenging rapids, making it suitable for paddlers with varying skill levels. However, some sections may require experienced paddling techniques, particularly around Nunatanawago Rapids. The route may involve portages, where paddlers need to carry their canoes and gear overland to bypass obstacles such as rapids or waterfalls. Adequate planning and physical stamina are essential for overcoming the difficulties of this trip. Canoeing down the Hayes River route is a mental and spiritual odyssey, and many outdoor enthusiasts must find their inner strength when facing the challenges of this arduous expedition. For Wolf Wagner and John Haunch, their Hayes River canoeing expedition would be treacherous. Wolf Wagner, 25, accompanied by his 26-year-old best friend, John Haunch, embarked on a Canadian canoeing adventure in northern Manitoba in the summer of 2017. After arriving in Winnipeg from Germany on July 16, 2017, the two tourists from Dresden set their sights northward with the plan of navigating from Norway House to Port Nelson through various bodies of water in the northern Canadian wilderness. In Winnipeg, they purchased a canoe through the Canadian equivalent of Craigslist, intending to paddle 380 miles on the Hayes River to Hudson Bay. The chosen route by Wolf and John is a renowned Canadian classic serving as a primary waterway for the historic fur trade and is now recognized as a rite of passage for canoe enthusiasts. Despite being a lengthy journey through remote wilderness typically taken on by seasoned paddlers in robust canoes, Wagner and Haunch, with limited experience, opted for a seemingly ill-suited vessel. Their chosen canoe was a thin-walled fiberglass model with a full keel and sponsons designed for novice tourists to stay upright on calm lakes. During the initial 10 days of their expedition, the pair, having some prior backwood canoeing experience, encountered no significant issues and were fully immersed in the grandeur of the North American wilderness. However, the situation took a turn and their adventure became more challenging than anticipated. While the journey proceeded according to the plan, it remained challenging. At a particular juncture, when they portaged their canoe and slid it on the ground, its poor quality became evident, leading to damage that necessitated repairs using the last of their repair kit. Surprisingly, this incident did not raise concerns about the vessel's overall quality. Despite having the option to cancel the trip at Oxford House, the final settlement before reaching Hudson Bay, they were resolute in completing the journey and felt confident about their success. Little did they anticipate that the perilous rapids immediately following Oxford House would prove too formidable for their canoe. On the evening of July 27, 2017, Wagner and Haunch encountered a challenging stretch of rapids known as the Nunatonawago Rapids on the Hayes River. Typically, canoe trippers opt to portage this section, but the duo couldn't locate a trail. 
Wagner explained. We arrived at the Nunatonawago Rapids, and it is very wide with steep shorelines with no possibility to portage or line it. Faced with limited options, they decided to navigate through the center and ended up grounding on rocky ledges. Alternating between taking a seat and propelling the boat forward, they encountered rough rocks causing significant wear and tear on the canoe. A grapefruit-sized piece was torn from the keel, leading the canoe to veer sideways and become stuck. Wagner submerged beneath the canoe to release it when it was fully submerged. Following this, the men seized one end of the boat and swam together towards the riverside. Fortunately, their belongings remained afloat and intact, connected by a rope. Despite the crash, they managed to swim to the riverbank and escape relatively unharmed. However, they realized their canoe was irreparably damaged. The crash occurred 50 kilometers northeast of Knee Lake, leaving them far from civilization with no means of communication for help. Faced with a survival challenge, Wagner and Haunch recognized that their next move was crucial for their well-being. They decided to rest before making any decisions, hanging up their wet clothes in an attempt to dry them. Wagner emphasized the importance of staying calm in such situations, saying, in a case like this, it is very important to keep cool. Our credo was, keep cool, keep your head, and use your head. So, we built up our energy, dried our paper navigation maps and clothes, and went to bed. The next morning brought a critical decision. With no means of communication, the duo left a note by their broken canoe and embarked on a northward journey on foot through the wilderness towards Gillam, Manitoba, a distance of 115 kilometers or 71 miles. Lacking satellite phones, PLBs, spot devices, or cell phone service, they estimated it would take four to five days, covering 15 to 20 kilometers or nine to 12 miles daily. However, the challenging muskeg terrain, characterized by marshy areas with a mix of water and decomposing vegetation covered by mosses, made their trek treacherous in this part of Canada. Their strategy involved taking a break every 30 minutes, pausing for a brief rest and some water. However, their initial disappointment arose when they realized they had only covered a mere 500 meters or a half mile after the first half hour of walking. Haunch explained the challenges of the soft ground, stating, when you're walking on the street, you have solid ground, and when you push off, everything is fine. But here, the ground was so soft that you're sinking in. This took a lot out of you. It takes more energy to lift your feet up and down than it does to move them forward. Equipped with a compass and a small GPS device, they aimed to stay on course. The first day of the trek was endured in near silence to conserve energy, and the prospect of reaching the road seemed uncertain. By the end of day one, they had covered less than six kilometers or 3.6 miles, with black flies and mosquitoes leaving their marks on their skin. We were so exhausted after that first day, Anch recalled. Facing a longer journey than initially anticipated, they had to ration their food supplies. A few fruit bars were available for snacking, but the limited provisions made it challenging to maintain a remotely healthy diet. They ensured hydration by drinking one liter of water each per hour, sourcing it en route and boiling it every night before bed. On the third day following the crash, Haunch later referred to as the longest day, their hike began at 7 a.m. However, heavy rain prompted them to stop and unfold a tarp on two occasions during their planned 13 kilometer route for the day. The lack of means to shield themselves from the weather compounded the challenges they faced. Along the way, the pair took photographs to document their journey, envisioning a future where they could recount the experience or, in the event of their death, provide insights into their ordeal if someone found their bodies. Wagner and Haunch persevered, adhering to a north-northwest compass bearing, aiming for the 15-mile stretch of blacktop linking Gillum with the settlement of Long Spruce, Manitoba. Carrying life jackets proved wise as they had to swim across several rivers each day. Essential gear, including rain jackets, boots, gloves, mosquito spray, GPS, paddle, tarp, and a biolite camp stove, played a crucial role. John emphasized the constant discomfort of wet feet, leading to numbness in their toes. Despite temperatures exceeding 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit during the day, the duo had to endure additional clothing to ward off persistent insect attacks. Nights brought temperatures close to freezing, frequently waking them to the bite of frost, with their perpetually wet boots often freezing stiff. 
Every bit of energy was directed towards moving forward with no time to appreciate the landscape. Breathless throughout the day, they only found respite during breaks, where they reassured each other saying, we will make it, according to Wagner. Although the prospect of injury was a topic they avoided discussing, the potential consequences were always on their minds. One day while wading through a lake, Wagner slipped and fell on his hip. Fortunately, it wasn't serious and averted disaster. After a few days, maintaining focus and preserving sanity became their most challenging ordeal. John reflected on moments when one of them would sit down and express the sentiment of not wanting to continue. There were instances where they felt they had given up on life, requiring constant motivation to push forward. As the days progressed, their daily routine turned into a form of torment. The prospect of what the day held for them made it increasingly difficult to leave the tent each morning. Heading north, the dropping temperatures added to their hardships, exacerbated by the frequent need to submerge themselves in large bodies of water. Wagner and Hanch even had to improvise a makeshift raft to transport their food and supplies across Stupert Lake. Wagner highlighted the persistent issue of wet shoes and the perpetual dampness of everything making it impossible to dry. Despite avoiding encounters with bears, wolves, or other dangerous carnivores, they found themselves battling formidable foes in the form of flies and mosquitoes. The relentless heat provided no respite throughout the expedition. Around the eighth day, a helicopter passed overhead, but despite their efforts to attract attention, the dense vegetation made them difficult to spot, leading to demoralization. Wolf admitted to maintaining a positive facade for John expressing confidence in their success while secretly harboring doubts about their survival. With a portion of their food supply salvaged from the crash, they had just enough energy for the arduous task. Breakfast and lunch consisted of two pieces of toast with chocolate spread each, followed by canned soup for dinner. At night, both squeezed into a compact 120-centimeter or four-foot tent for shelter. On the 11th day, with John and Wolf depleting their final food supplies, they trudged wearily, drenched, and utterly exhausted. The seemingly endless trek had brought them to the brink, with the Canadian wilderness threatening to engulf them. Amidst their routine traverse of muskeg, plagued by relentless flies and mosquitoes, a hopeful moment occurred. Pausing, they wondered, listen, is that a car? Wolf Wagner and John Hanch had finally neared the paved road they sought, although it still required a 20-minute trek before reaching it. Emerging from the wilderness, about 15 kilometers or 9 miles from Gillam, they heard an approaching car and attempted to signal the driver to stop, only to be ignored by the first few vehicles. The initial dismissals were disheartening for Haunch, who said, It was hard, especially because we had so many good experiences with the people in Manitoba and their northern hospitality. Despite Wagner's optimism about hitchhiking, he acknowledged the understandable hesitation of passing drivers, given their bug-bitten appearance, life jackets, and a paddle. It wasn't until the sixth vehicle that a Manitoba hydro worker named Aaron Shell finally pulled over, intrigued by their unconventional presence. Shell initially found their story hard to believe, but grew engrossed as they conversed during the journey to civilization. Shell drove the Germans to a hotel in Gillam. By the time we got to town, I realized the guys needed some food and lodging, and I had to get them to the hotel. It's Sunday, so no one is at the front desk, so we had to wait. Maybe I was typecasting as their German, and I'm German myself, and asked them if they would like a cold beer while we wait. And that was a resounding yes, Shell recalled. John and Wolf visit the local bar in Gillam, where they relish drinks in the company of their newfound friend and rescuer. To this day, they still remain friends with Shell and stay in contact. Eventually, they were able to get a room for a much-needed shower, cleaning up and resembling their appearance at the journey's start, albeit 20 pounds or 9 kilos thinner. Subsequently, they headed to a local watering hole, devouring two large pizzas. Sharing their harrowing ordeal with the bartender, they were rewarded with free beer and liquor. The day concluded with a long night of well-deserved rest. Despite their weight loss and numerous bug bites, Wagner and Hunch appeared to be in surprisingly good mental and physical condition, not requiring a hospital visit. 
The paddle they carried with them, which became a crucial tool to navigate the muskeg terrain during their ordeal, became a symbol of their resilience. They desired to return it to Germany, but knew that transporting the item in its original condition would incur additional fees. In an attempt to bring the paddle with them to circumvent extra transportation charges, they broke the paddle in two to fit in the luggage. When we were back in Germany, I put it back together with glue and we cut through the paddle in the middle. And now John has one half and I have the other half, Wolf said. They returned to Winnipeg, catching their scheduled flight back to Germany as planned. Three weeks after they abandoned the canoe, experienced river runner Scott Robertson found the boat and their note. When I first saw their canoe, this Mickey Mouse rat shit canoe, I found it hard to believe anyone would be foolish enough to take that route with such poor equipment, he recalled. He tried to wrap his head around what he and his partner were seeing. The canoe was way below standards to attempt a trip as daunting as the Hayes River to Hudson Bay route. It appeared the friends attempted to seal the leaks with spruce gum. Whoever sold those boys that canoe should be locked up, Scott said. Robertson and his paddling partner reached Hudson Bay a few days later and immediately reported the canoe and note they had found. To their great relief, the Mounties told them the boys were safe. Embarking on such a challenging canoe trip, especially without the appropriate experience and preparation, was a decision they had no business making. However, armed with a map, compass, and GPS, they possessed the knowledge to utilize these tools effectively. Beyond technical skills, their Resilience and clear-headedness played a crucial role in their survival. John mentioned that listening to podcasts saved on their phones, which miraculously survived the crash, helped them maintain their sanity during the ordeal. The thought of their loved ones served as a powerful motivator, preventing them from giving up throughout the entire ordeal. Despite making it safely back to Dresden, Germany, Wolf expressed their willingness to return to northern Manitoba for a similar rugged outdoorsy vacation. We say we have walked through hell, the mosquitoes, the black flies everywhere. I still see the bites on my body and we have walked in wet shoes. Sometimes we think we have learned a lot about our bodies, our condition and our relationship to each other. We lost civilization, things like fast food or something like that, or having dry shoes. We care about it much more now, Wolf said. Wolf Wagner reflected on how the experience strengthened his friendship with John Haunch. He stated, it's one of the best things in life. When you know you can rely on someone with your life on the line, what we went through those two weeks together, we know we can always rely on each other in the future. I'm not sure if there's anyone else can come that close in my life. John shared the same sentiment, stating, maybe it's something you cannot say with words. It's a special kind of relationship to rely on each other, to depend on each other. You don't question that friendship afterward. Canoeing in remote areas demands not just an appreciation for nature, but a profound understanding of its formidable forces. Ignorance and a lack of respect for the inherent dangers can transform what might have been an adventurous exploration into a perilous struggle for survival. If stranded during a remote canoeing trip, stay calm, assess the surroundings, and construct a shelter using natural materials or available equipment. Ensure a safe water supply build a fire for warmth and signaling, and ration food. Wear bright colors for visibility and keep clothing dry to prevent hypothermia. Promptly treat injuries and use the canoe as a shelter or signaling device. If you decide to hike out of a remote area during a canoeing trip, careful planning and navigation are crucial for your safety. Evaluate your physical condition, available supplies, and terrain before deciding to hike out. Consider factors like weather, daylight, and the difficulty of the terrain. Use a map, and compass to navigate. GPS devices can be helpful, but they may not always work in remote areas, so having traditional navigation tools is essential. Plan a realistic route based on your physical abilities and the terrain. Stick to known trails or natural features if possible. Avoid steep or hazardous terrain. If you're in a group, leave a note indicating your intention to hike out at your current location. Include details about your planned route and estimated time of return. Carry an adequate supply of water. Water sources may be scarce in a remote area, so plan accordingly. Whenever possible, plan your hiking to occur during daylight hours. Visibility is crucial for navigation and avoiding potential hazards. Pace yourself to avoid exhaustion. Take breaks when needed, especially if you are carrying a heavy backpack. Identify prominent landmarks to help with navigation. 
pay attention to distinctive features that can serve as reference points. Stick to established trails whenever possible. Trails provide a more defined and safer route through the wilderness, maintain a positive mindset, focus on the task at hand, and stay optimistic. A positive mental attitude can help you overcome challenges. Always prioritize safety, and if you're unsure about your ability to hike out, or if conditions are too challenging, it may be safer to stay put and await rescue. In any case, careful planning and preparedness are essential for a successful hike out of a remote area. Important tips so you make it through an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.